The winter of 1880-1881 was brutal in Minnesota, but some of the stories have been forgotten. This video examines it from the eyes of the Morris newspaper and its editor, W.J. Monroe. Make sure to check out my other video about this winter from the New Ulm perspective. The blue boxes on the various calendar dates are storms that occurred that winter in New Ulm. For the Morris winter, storm dates will be shown in red. To start off, New Ulm is further south in Minnesota than Morris. Topography played a large role in the degree of impact throughout the 1880 and 1881 Minnesota winter. The Red River Valley was a flat plain with very few trees. The Minnesota River Valley had a bit more terrain and trees, but there were still huge open stretches. There was very little shelter from northwest winds, which was also the most common wind direction. Conversely, southeast winds had the same effect. Morris tended to be slightly more open than New Ulm, which tended to make its winters worse. Looking a little closer at the Morris area, most of the towns were built on the railroad, which was the St. Paul, Minneapolis, and Manitoba. Its main line extended from Benson to Herman, while a branch line extended west of Morris to Browns Valley. This topographical map shows how flat the area is around Morris. The overlay shows that more terrain and tree cover were located just to the east of the Morris area. You can see how northwest or southeast winds would have made the branch line more susceptible to drifting snow. The town of Morris was also aligned northwest to southeast along the railroad. Its main street, or primary business district, was called Atlantic Avenue. So, let's see what happened during the historic winter at Morris and how it affected its railroad lines. In its October 7, 1880 issue, the Morris Tribune noted that waterfowl were still very numerous on Big Stone Lake. There was basically no supply of wood in town and the weather had been very nice lately, or chic. There was a Catholic-sponsored Irish settlement between Morris and Graceville, with immigrants from the Connemara region of Ireland. These poor and weakened people had traveled to the United States to escape the Irish famine of 1879. They had just moved to the area in the summer of 1880, and had been given some land in a small frame house. It was hoped that they would become self-sufficient farmers, although most of them knew little to nothing about farming. The people of Morris felt the settlement was a terrible blunder. A week later, the Tribune wrote that prairie fires were becoming more common. Some nights were cold enough to frost, and the ground was too dry to plow. The railroad had begun to stock coal in town for its locomotives. Normalcy came to a screeching halt from October 15th to 17th as an early blizzard struck the area. Despite leaving huge snowdrifts, it could have been worse as there was no intense cold. This blizzard brought tremendous impacts. Trains were trapped in snowdrifts and telegraph lines were snapped. People were not yet prepared for winter, and poultry losses were great. One young man got lost in the storm and wandered around for three hours before luckily coming across a house. Three quarters of the grain crop was still in stacks in the field. Walking into the wind was blinding and confusing, and huge waves damaged the flour mill south of town. One man died near Herman, and a lot of stock perished. At Donnelly, a man got lost on the prairie, but ultimately reached shelter in a bad state. 
another group out on the prairie in a canvas tent, were trapped without much fuel. They survived by burning chairs, a table, and even some of their provisions. In Morris, a flag was torn to shreds and a windmill was damaged. Residents were buying more coal than wood stoves, thinking coal would be more readily available. Prairie chickens also perished in large numbers where they had insufficient shelter. The mail system was in disarray. A Connemara immigrant from St. Paul, who was visiting his parents west of Morris, was caught in the storm for three days. He managed to find a haystack and survive, but his feet were badly frozen. Snow shovelers and six locomotives were brought in to clear the railroad lines. More bad news arrived on October 28th, when another man was found dead near Frog Lake. He was found buried in a snowdrift with only his feet exposed. It was thought that poor road conditions would prevent a good voter turnout in the upcoming election. A third man died near Graceville. He had found shelter, but had no way to keep warm. A train load of wood arrived, which was a welcome sight, and the railroad continued to stock coal. It had even warmed up enough for some of the snow to melt, creating large puddles on the streets. In early November, the Tribune reported the mud and snow were disappearing from the streets, but there was still very little wood in the village. The second storm of the season struck on November 10th and 11th on strong northwest winds. Wood was being received, but it was poor quality wood. Complaints were heard from all the railroad towns about the lack of wood reserves. Meanwhile, Graceville noted that over a dozen new buildings had been erected, which likely blocked a lot of snow. Railroad officials in St. Paul acknowledged the danger to these frontier towns if the trains could not get through the snow. They encouraged people to always keep a week's supply of wood on hand. James J. Hill, the railroad's general manager, claimed he had delivered 3,000 cords of wood along the line since October 1st, which averaged about 20 cars a day. One train got stuck in a drift west of Morris, so the passengers had to walk the two miles back to town. Another train got stuck near Graceville. The railroad complained that it was difficult to find men and teams to work digging out the snow. Mr. Dowers opened a second wood yard in Morris but whenever wood arrived, there was a rush for it. Wild rumors were coming out of the Connemara settlement about entire families being frozen or being without food or fuel. To determine what was going on, the people of Morris thought it would be wise to send a reliable party there to investigate. Eight carloads of wood also arrived in Morris. A light snow fell on November 27th, and it was still relatively warm. The December 2nd issue of the Morris Tribune noted that most people didn't have the money to pay for a winter supply of fuel ahead of time, so they lived week to week. The fresh snow made sleighing much easier. Getting outdoors helped break the winter's monotony. Another blizzard struck on December 4th, with much colder temperatures, which was followed by another three inches of snow on the 7th. This blocked the branch line west of Morris, and the snow was so hard packed it had to be removed by pick and shovel. In Morris, a special committee was formed to look into the condition of the Connemara settlers. A search party was formed in Hancock to try to locate two missing men. The men later turned up in Benson. Telegraph poles for the Browns Valley branch line and portable snow fencing arrived in early December. It was hoped this would prevent drifting on the railroad line. Another man got lost west of Morris 
and luckily found shelter after following a glimmer of light from a window. A different man tried to make it home with a load of wood, but got lost and was found lying on the prairie frozen. Coal supplies in Morris were non-existent, leaving the people who had bought coal-burning stoves quite upset. To see the condition of the line himself, James J. Hill traveled along the railroad in his private car. Morris residents threatened to raid the railroad's shed and help themselves to the coal. They heard that coal shipments coming from Duluth were extremely slow and joked that an ox cart line would move it along faster. In Clontarf, angry residents helped themselves to a railroad car of wood. The nights were getting very cold, some 30 plus degrees below zero. The cold did not last long, with the December 16th issue of the Tribune noting that the weather had turned more agreeable. This allowed the Morris Committee to visit the Connemara settlement and report back. The report was not good. It said the Connemaras were receiving inhumane treatment. The families were in a terrible state of destitution. Many of the adults were feeble. 137 children did not have enough warm clothing. There was a general lack of food, warm clothing, blankets, and fuel. A copy of their report was forwarded to the governor and Bishop Ireland, who was in charge of the settlement. In the meantime, Morris made a call for aid from their citizens, who responded very generously with a large supply of food, clothing, and footwear. The governor responded by saying that measures were being taken to supply the settlement with the needed items. Meanwhile, the condition of the wood being brought to Morris was declining, some being rotten and worthless. Despite that, the railroad kept bringing in more wood to the towns along its path. There were worries in Morris that additional storms would bring continued suffering to the Connemara settlement. Another winter storm struck on December 26th, bringing more snow and blowing snow. This was followed by a blizzard two days later one that raged over 36 hours. Once again, traffic on the branch line was suspended. One engine developed troubles, frustrating the passengers. To get better quality wood, one hotel started hauling its own wood from Holmes City. In early January, it was announced that the Connemara families would be removed to other areas of the state in the spring. James J. Hill and several other wealthy men donated flannel, and 63 large blankets were made. However, when Bishop Ireland and his contingent went to deliver them personally, even they lost their way in the dark and snow. With the lack of regular train traffic, an immense amount of mail began to back up. Temperatures regularly dropped well below zero reminding residents of what the North Pole may feel like. In Donnelly, wood was scarce, but coal was still available. The Manitoba Railroad brought more snow fencing for the branch line, which it installed on top of the huge drifts. Residents were reminded to check their chimneys, as they didn't want to add a destructive fire to the problems of the winter. Despite the cold, there were also some mild days mixed in. Bishop Ireland sent a new priest to the Connemara settlement to help with their removal. There was no let up in the weather. A high wind event on January 21st blew the snow into more drifts. This was followed several days later by another blizzard. The drifts stopped all railroad traffic on the main line and on the branch line. On the few good days, teams from the country lined the streets of Morris as settlers sought to replenish their supplies. When the trains made it through, they brought more wood. Another heavy snow event at the end of January 
brought one of the heaviest snowfalls of the season. Several days later, there was another blowing snow event. The huge snowdrifts made it hard just to move around town. Shoveling the heavy snow was back-breaking work. Wood quality continued to suffer, and there was an expectation that it would not get any better for the rest of the winter. In early February, there was another three-day blizzard. This created monster drifts, although the temperature remained relatively mild. This event blocked the main railroad line for five days, its first major shutdown in the past four years. Rather than wait for the railroad to get the track cleared, two young women from St. Paul walked three miles through the deep snow to join another train. People joked that rather than shoveling, they should just tunnel underneath the huge drifts. Many children had difficulty making it to school. They hated to miss, as the teacher always read the names of the tardy ones in front of the entire student body. Morris residents loved to watch the huge snow plows in action. Crowds would assemble to watch them work. They would back up and take a long run at a drift. This would send the snow flying and often bury the plow and the engine. One engineer said, we go at it blind as fast as she will go and hang on until she stops. This was a battle of man against nature. On warmer days, both the young and old indulged in snowball fights. The situation reminded the editor of his boyhood days, climbing up and down the tall snowdrifts. If he didn't blow off some steam, it could drive you crazy. There was still an immense amount of loose snow on the ground, and people knew it was just a matter of time before the wind would blow again. And blow it did this time on February 12th, with strong northwest winds. The railroad tried to clear the branch line, but it took over a day's work just to clear one mile. The steam locomotives had to be filled with snow, as the water supply had dried up. Luckily, there was no shortage of snow around. People thought the railroad might abandon the branch line due to the struggles of trying to keep it open. The telegraph lines to Browns Valley were down for about two weeks. Two engines and a snowplow made a run at a drift west of Morris, but instead of pushing the snow aside, the plow ran up the drift, damaging the entire train. Shovelers began to think that $1.25 per day was not enough for their work, and struck for higher wages. The work must have been exhausting. A new plow soon arrived to replace the damaged one, and the work went on. On the main line, a train got stuck in a drift near Herman, where it sat for several days. Two men thought they could put on snowshoes and walk west, but after trying for several hours, they returned to town. Wood continued to arrive in Morris, but it was mostly green. At the halfway house, 10 boxcars were buried under 20-foot snowdrifts. Food staples were running short, especially potatoes, butter, and eggs. At Graceville, the depot and elevator were buried under huge drifts. Even farmhouses and barns were buried in the deep snow. Another winter storm struck on the 21st and 22nd of February. This shut down rail traffic on the main and branch lines. On the warm days, the snowbanks were gradually settling. However, there was not much let up in the wintry weather. Another blizzard struck at the end of February, followed by a blowing snow event in early March. This shut down all railroad traffic again but efforts to reopen the roads continued. This must have gotten quite frustrating for all involved, as another three-day blizzard occurred from March 3rd to 5th. Any work that had been completed had to be redone, 
and many dead engines had to be restarted. There were a few reports of people having to burn their extra furniture to keep warm, as it was too dangerous to attempt to travel. On the quiet days, the children enjoyed themselves immensely. The onslaught would just not quit. Another winter storm occurred on the 10th and 11th, followed by more snow on the 14th and 15th. This shut down all efforts to reopen the railroads. A small army of shovelers and 12 locomotives now worked to clear the tracks of snow. Some people had to resort to burning hay at times to stay warm. One day, an engineer saw a boy running toward the track, waving a colored cloth on a stick. The boy said his family had run out of wood, so he was given an ample supply. The Tribune said that only two or three of the Connemara families would remain in the settlement. Several boys who got a little too close to the snowplow were injured by flying chunks of snow. A blowing snow event occurred on March 19th. This filled the cuts back in with snow, resulting in another short blockade. However, there were warm days as well, which made a dent in the size of the drifts. However, if anyone thought winter was done, it wasn't. Another blizzard struck at the end of March on strong northwest winds. This brought rail service to another standstill. Long-time railroad employees said it had been the hardest winter since 1873-74. Young folks at a dance in Hancock were trapped by the weather. The warm periods caused some snowmelt, especially in the bare black fields. Waterfowl returned to the area, loving all the extra water puddles. Residents who had left for the winter began to return, and were surprised to see all the snow still on the ground. The freezing and thawing of the snow began to make it impossible to use the snowplow, so the remaining snow had to be shoveled by hand. Hundreds of shovelers continued to work every day, and they slowly reopened the railroad lines. One final blowing snow event occurred in early April. This event was most impactful on the branch line, where work once again had to be abandoned. The editor noted that farmers should start to plant more trees to block the strong winter winds. As the last of the snow melted, water ran off everywhere. As the water finally receded, the farmers could get back in their fields. This winter will always be remembered as one of the worst of all time. It also showed that the western frontier was no place for someone who was unprepared. That concludes the video. Make sure to check out my other YouTube videos and my primary website at mnbricks.com.